Well, last week we began uh, a look at the book of Acts. We looked at one of the defining moments when the disciples made this revelation that you didn't have to be a Jew in order to follow Jesus. And this is what made it possible for the church to expand uh, rapidly. Uh, the book of Acts chronicles the story of the, of the growth of the church, starting uh, in Jerusalem, going to Judea, Samaria, um, and then well beyond that as well. Last week, when our setting, if you remember, was, uh, was uh, Caesarea. Um, that's where uh, the reach extended to the home of a, of a Roman uh, officer, uh, a Gentile, uh, in, in the capital city of the Roman province of Judea. Today we're going to go further, further on out. We're going all the way up to Antioch, uh, which is in today what we call uh, Turkey. So reading from, uh, uh, from the book of Acts. Now the church in Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Luke, uh, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a member of the court of Herod, the ruler, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for work that I've called them to do. And after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So no longer do we have simply a group of Galilean fishermen to follow Jesus. Um, we have a list of here five people. Uh, the first one was Barnabas, who's come Cyprus, all right? Simeon, whose name was Niger, presumes that he was from Africa. Lucius, good Roman name, was from Cyrene. Menaean said he was a member of Herod's court, which means he would have been from Jerusalem. And Saul is from what today we call, again, we call Turkey. Already, the Christian, uh, 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 the makeup of, of the Christians gathering was a rich diversity which allowed them to reach, uh, reach out into the world. Now the person we're gonna focus on here is Saul. Saul was a former Pharisee, responsible for the death of many of the followers of Jesus before he had this conversion experience. Um, and we, we call, his name was Saul, but we also know him as, as Paul. So Paul and Barnabas were chosen to go out uh, to share the good news. And Paul makes three journeys. Last, uh, was it last year or two years ago? We, did, we went all the way through the book of Acts. Uh, he makes three journeys. The uh, first journey he makes with uh, Barnabas. They travel to Cyprus uh, because that's where Barnabas was from. Then they make their uh, area through the area that Paul was familiar with, Asia Minor. Today we're going to pick up the story again. We get to a place which is called Lystra. All right. So, in Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He had never walked, for he had been crippled from birth. He listened to Paul as he was speaking, and Paul, looking at him intently, seeing that he had faith to be healed, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And the man sprang up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted out in Laconian language, The gods have come to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates. He and the crowds wanted to offer sacrifice. Well, when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard it, they tore their clothes. They rushed out into the crowds shouting, Friends, why are you doing this? We're just mortals like you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from the worthless things to the living God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. In the past generations, he allowed all nations to follow their own ways, yet he's not left himself without a witness in doing good, in giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons and filling you with food and your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they scarcely restrain the crowds from offering sacrifices to them. All right, so cross-cultural work is not without its problems, right? As the disciples moved farther and farther away from Jerusalem, they changed how they told the story of Jesus. No longer could they simply point to Jesus as a fulfillment of Jewish prophecy because they were going to be in cultures where there was no Jewish frame of reference. 
Uh, now, if there was a Jewish community, Paul would often start there because he had something in common with them, but the gospel was for the whole world. We start with which we know, uh, and then we often we make assumptions from that, but as we know, oftentimes assumptions can be wrong. The people of, of Lystra, uh, their assumption was that if, if uh, someone did a miracle, it was some of the gods who were taking human form. That was what they knew from their Greek, Greek mythology. Um, the gods visiting in human form. That's why there was a temple of Zeus right there in Lystra because Zeus would take human form and come and walk among the people. And they assumed that's what was happening here. Um, so we, we, see what they, we see what we expect to see, right? To see something differently than we're expecting is a big step, but that's exactly what the gospel is is calling for. Paul comes and it challenges the assumptions the people had, and that is going to get him in trouble. Uh, they're going to try to, they'll turn on him, they'll eventually they'll, they'll try to kill him. But for now, they're enthralled by the miraculous healing that they have witnessed, and they're trying to figure out, what does this mean? Well, like we talked about last week, Paul uh, doesn't bring God to the people of Lystra. God was already there. Paul's job was simply to help them see where God was already at work in their lives. And he points to the witness of creation, right? He says, God's not without a witness here. The rains come freely and bless your lives. Now, you can look at rain and simply say, that's just rain. Um, or you can say, this is the hand of God. Depends on your perspective. Uh, our perspective changes how we see the world. Almost 30 years ago, we, uh, we launched a, a, a telescope up into space, and it's still up there, Hubble te Telescope, circling around 340 miles above the Earth, uh, 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 in orbit around the Earth. It allows us to see what is impossible to see from Earth. From Earth, we, there's too much um, distortion trying to look through the atmosphere, but if you put the telescope up there, you can see things from a different perspective. See things you can't see from Earth. Amazing images come back. They allow us to look back in time. Um, you know, not just distance, but, but in time, because what we're looking at is things that happened a long time ago, thousands of years ago, because light traveling at the speed of light just takes, is now just reaching us, things that happened thousands and thousands of years ago. We're just seeing now, we realize that once we see images that the space is not simply cold and empty, but it's something of great beauty and awe. Um, I love this image. It's a, it's a stellar nursery uh, where stars are in the process of being formed. And it's 20,000 light years away from here. Now, how far is 20,000 light years it's more than I can imagine. I don't, I don't know, that, that big a number just doesn't translate to say how far away this is, um, that the stellar nursery is being formed. Uh, or this one, it's called the Butterfly Nebula, NG66302. Um, it's a dying star ejecting these roiling cauldrons of gas, unleashing streams of ultraviolet radiation. And we just think it's pretty, right? Uh, but there it is, this, this massive event uh, of a star that has exploded. Uh, and we can see it. Uh, or this one, this is a, it's called the Crab Nebula. It's a remnant of a supernova that has exploded. A little, a thousand years ago, Chinese astronomers noticed a new light in the sky was the Crab Nebula going supernova. It's still expanding, it's still exploding, and so from one end to the other, it's over six light years in its size. Um, try to get some perspective. You know, from here to the Earth, uh, it takes about eight minutes for light, to, or from the Earth to the Sun, it takes about eight minutes. You know, imagine how far it can go, if it can go that far in eight minutes, how far can it go in a year, and this is, Six light years, just across one, one uh, object up in, up in the heavens. Or this one, ARP 273. Uh, two galaxies that are in the process of colliding, each of them made up with billions of stars. 
But this is the one that really blows my mind, right? We said, let's take the telescope, let's point it to where it's dark uh, in the heavens, where we can't see anything, you know? And so we're gonna point it at this place in where, you know, that, we, that all we can tell is that it's completely dark, that there is nothing out there. But let's leave the shutter open for a little while, see what happens. You know, if you do put, leave the shutter open, let's more light come in, you can see images that you can't see otherwise. So they left the shutter open for 140 hours, <laughs> all right? Focus on the same place, open the shutter for 140 hours, and this is what they saw. Those aren't stars, those are galaxies. Um, and instead of simple stars, it's still too far away to see a star, but those, each of those are galaxies made up of billions of stars. In the one area, they said there were 3,000 galaxies each made up of billions of stars, which means there's tens of billions of galaxies out there that we can't even see. So what does this all mean? Um, for some, it may not mean anything, all right? We, we drive home, we drive into the garage, we go from the garage into the house, we never look up, we never wonder about what's out there. But for others, uh, as we p contemplate our place in this universe that we have. There's deep, wonderful mystery. We recognize we are part of something so much bigger than ourselves, bigger than we can even hope to imagine. And once we embrace that kind of mystery, we can't help but have an openness to the creator of all that exists. If we spend all of our time and energy on ourselves, the world looks one way, right? <laughs> But if we look out instead of looking in, we take a step back, we see a bigger picture, it changes how we see the world. When we lose the sense of awe, we lose something really important. There's something, I believe, remarkable about understanding the vastness of creation, at the same time knowing that we are loved, uh, known by the creator of it all. Creation as a witness is a wonderful thing. And the more we live our lives indoors, disconnected from that, the weaker its witness is to us. That's one of the reasons why I, I, I'm so passionate about our kids going to, to Bible camp, to get outside, to get unplugged for a week. Um, uh, that's why we want to make sure everyone who wants to go to Bible camp can do that. Our Jay Welka helps do that. And, and if it goes beyond that, we say, uh, anyone who wants to go will make sure that they can get there. Um, and so if you've got kids or grandkids um, and you need to get them unplugged for a week, understand the awe of creation. I can't think of a better way to do that than, than Bible camp. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, let me shift gears a little bit here. Um, today is a time as a nation that we pause and reflect and we give thanks uh, for, for mothers. Um, and we know that, uh, that families come in all shapes and sizes, and so does, so does mothering, um, which sometimes makes Mother's Day just a little bit, little bit tricky. Some of us have, have wonderful relationships with our mothers. Some of us don't. Um, for some of us, Mother's Day reminds us of a significant loss in your lives. Um, some of you may notice I, sometimes I wear different, different crosses um, this is one that my mom wore for, as I remember as a, as a little kid, you know, watching her. They had gone to, I think they went to vacation in Arizona and bought something, a little chunks of turquoise in it. Um, and so when I want to remember my mom, I just feel closer when I can, uh, when I can do that. So for some, Mother's Day is, is a day of significant loss in their lives. For others, um, it's a joyful celebration uh, and deep thankfulness um, not everyone who has wanted to be a mother has been able to be a mother. And some became mothers reluctantly. But as we gather and we remember today, we recognize that motherhood is, is more than simply uh, genetics or heredity. It's so much more about the relationships that have shaped and formed us. Um, so this year, I just want to have us take a moment and reflect on those who have mothered us uh, uh, whether it's uh, by their relationships or, or by blood, uh, been significant for us, and we want to offer up a, a prayer for them.
If you join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our earthly mothers, for all those who have shown a mother's love and care to us. Remind us of those who have lost, who have never known their mothers, those who may be in conflict or are estranged from their mothers, for those who desire children but struggle to or cannot have them. Make us all family to one another, looking not to our own interests but to the interests of others. Lord, we give you deep and wonderful thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's a wonderful hymn that uh, uses mothering language from the scripture. So Joan, you can come right up here. Jesus, uh, Jesus uh, used it to describe himself and his love for us. We looked at, we looked at this last year. to talk about the story of a, of a mother hen and the chicks. And Jesus, when he was talking, talking with the disciples uh, towards the end of his life, he says, oh, how I've desired to gather your children together just the way that a hen gathers her brood under her wings. But you're not willing. And so we have this wonderful hymn, it's called Thy Holy Wings, where Jesus says, I wish, I, I'm like a mother hen, you know, and I wish, I just want to gather you all and hold you, hold you tight, those, those special moments. Um, always, uh, so I always tell people, get a, my mom was a big hugger, so you couldn't, you couldn't get away <laughs> with, without a hug. Uh, and that I love the sense of, of God enfolding us in his hug, this uh, holy wings that surround us. I invite you to rise if you're able as we as we sing thy holy wings. <laughs> 